the nation we know as Scotland today was shaped by the events of the early Middle Ages. Before there was a kingdom known as Scotland, it was populated by a mosaic of peoples we know as Picts, Scots, Britons, and Anglo-Saxons. The first Viking raids of the late 8th and 9th centuries would throw these kingdoms into turmoil. How did we get from these regional powers to the Kingdom of Scotland? This new book, the third resulting from the Glenmorangie Research Project, investigates the story of the 9th to the 12th centuries using the collections of National Museums Scotland. The first thing that catches your eye when you walk into the Kingdom of Scots Gallery in the National Museum is the Forteviate Arch. It's all that remains of what must have been a grand Pictish church in stone in what's now rural Perthshire. The large figure on the left is likely a depiction of King Constantine, who died in the year 820. His reign coincided with the first Viking raids in Scotland. He built himself a palatial residence in the heart of one of the most fertile valleys in his kingdom, showing the imperial ambitions of the Picts at their height. The wealth of the monasteries, signaled by the richly carved crosses that still dot the landscape today, would have drawn Viking raiders. We know that many saints' relics were carried off in those days because we find them in graves from Scotland to Scandinavia. Sometimes they were cut up and recycled, made into brooches and other dress items. Other times they were kept intact as if they retained some aspect of their supernatural power, even in a pagan context. But I wanted to understand what happened when the Age of Raids became an age of settlement. Scotland has a remarkable collection of over 200 Viking Age burials, forming some of the earliest finds acquired into the National Museum's collections. For every one that is on display, there are several more that remain safely curated in our storage facility, the National Museum's Collection Center. This is where I carried out the best part of my research over the last three years. Rather than digging in the ground, I was privileged enough to dig in the museum itself. This meant taking a close look at several objects which have rarely, if ever, been on public view. Objects like Viking swords, can be heavily corroded, but on close inspection, they can reveal intricate ornamentation. I was also able to discover or identify for the first time objects that were not recognized in our collections. I was really taken aback when I stumbled upon this in an excavation archive from Coldingham Priory in the Scottish borders. This little thing is a bead of carnelian. It's a rare material which is found from maybe as far as India. It's one of very few known from Scotland so far. Every single one of them comes from a Viking camp or a Viking settlement. And this one comes from the Scottish borders, an area not known to have much Viking Age activity. Is this evidence for the movement of a Viking army uh, through the Scottish borders? something that is not really very well recorded. Objects like these have the potential to create unwritten stories for Scotland. This is probably one of my favorite objects in the museum. Uh, for me, this object captures the Viking Age in Scotland in a single object. This is the so-called West Ness brooch. It was found in a Viking burial in West Ness on the island of Rouse in Orkney. This is a, a woman who was buried with full Viking style burial. She was wearing oval brooches, the Scandinavian form of female dress. She was wearing a large beaded necklace. She had lots of grave goods all around her, the stuff that she would have used in her life and stuff that showed her status in her community. In between these Scandinavian oval brooches, she is wearing something that would have been recognized as something that only royalty, aristocracy, or maybe even clergy would have been allowed to wear. I think it's making a pretty loud statement of a person who can move in both Scandinavian and insular Scottish-Irish circles. 
The project involved the capture of over 500 new images of objects in our collection. While carefully packaging up objects from a hoard from Croy near Inverness, I spotted a small runic inscription, never before seen, on a bronze balance beam which had been in our collection since 1876. And the big surprise was that it wasn't in Norse runes like the Vikings used, but in Anglo-Saxon runes. It is currently the most northerly Anglo-Saxon runic inscription in Britain. And it's a very simple message. It just says, the weigher, or weigh, or weight, which refers to the function of the balance beam. So not only is there an object that is supposed to be Viking, marked with Anglo-Saxon runes, it's also found in the heart of the Pictish kingdom of Fertru. Looking at our collection with fresh eyes, even our most iconic objects have the chance to tell new stories. The Hunterston brooch is a masterpiece of early insular craft, made before the Viking Age and kept for centuries as an important heirloom. At a certain point in the 10th century, it passed into Viking hands, and we know that because an old Norse runic inscription was scratched onto the back. In an interesting twist, while the words and writing are in Old Norse, the name Malbritha is a common Gaelic name. There's so much silver coming into Scotland at this time, we have to ask what it was being exchanged for. We have massive silver hoards, like one from Scale in Orkney, that are so large that they might be tribute payments, the kind of payments you make to keep the peace, or maybe the payments for mercenaries. One of the nearest finds to the Hunterston brooch is an Arabic silver coin known as a Durham. It's come from as far as Central Asia, and it ended up in the area of Stevenson Sands, near the fine spot of the Hunterston brooch. It shows that the Hunterston brooch falls under a time when a lot of silver and new money was coming into West Scotland from the Irish Sea Zone and Scandinavia beyond that. Into the 11th and 12th centuries, we begin to get new objects appearing in Scotland, which also show up in Britain and Ireland regardless of political boundaries. It shows that fashions and material culture were becoming more Europeanized, and shows that Scotland was part of much larger trends. But whether we are talking about castles or church architecture or material culture like these, what we are seeing is a local Scottish take on much wider European trends. What happens when we look at the 9th to the 12th centuries from a Scottish perspective? It tells us that there is more to the Viking Age than raiders from Scandinavia. Viking settlers will have adopted insular languages and insular styles of dress, just as some people in Britain and Ireland will have seen the way the wind was blowing and potentially went Viking themselves. The 10th and the 11th centuries can be called a Silver Age, but what was all the silver for, and what did it mean to participate or opt out of that silver economy? The end of the period in the 11th and 12th centuries is often seen as something completely different from what came before. But you can hear echoes of the Viking Age if only we are prepared to listen. <laughs> 